In my hands is a board with a late Intel Pentium 4 at 3 GHz. Back in 2004, it was top notch, the best thing your money could buy. But just a few years later, the era of dual core Core 2 Duo came. Later, in the early 2010s, AMD surprised the world with the 8 core FX processors. Now you can find 16 and 24 core processors in almost any store. It may seem that this race between Team Red and Team Blue is only gaining momentum. But what if I told you that 6 and 8 core processors are here to stay for a long time, and not in the form of low tier Celeron and Pentium, but as at least mid tier CPUs suitable for games and even productivity tasks? This core count arms race is going nowhere now, just the way it was with the 4 cores in the last decade. Why is this happening again and how does Nvidia contribute to it? What does the monitors have to do with it and when will this historical cycle end? This is MK. Today we are talking about a new stagnation era. And let's start as usual with a little bit of history. For three decades, no one would ever think of such a thing as a multi-core processor, starting with Intel 4004 from the 70s and ending with Pentium 4 from the mid-2000s, the core count was not something you'd ever hear people talking about. Of course, architectures developed, new instructions appeared, processors became super scalar, multi-threaded, we talked about all this in one of our previous videos. But the qualitative leap from one core into two in desktops occurred only in 2005 when AMD introduced its expensive Athlon 64X2. Just a year later, Intel showed a powerful stack of two core 2 duos calling it Quad. That is, after a 30 year stagnation in just two years, the chips have made a significant breakthrough in their core count by as much as four times. However, back in the days, almost no one noticed the progress. All game engines and a considerable part of the home user software were designed with a single core in mind, and PC Mark considered the 2 core Core 2 Duo to be better than the 4 core Quad because of its higher clock speed. So, getting a 4 core Quad in 2006 made sense only for highly specialized tasks such as rendering, which in 2006 was of little interest to anyone. People would buy high end machines for gaming mostly and games back then didn't show any difference between 2-core duos and 4-core quads at all. Users continued to use single-core Athlons and Celerons, and game developers indulged them in this. It is not surprising that the release of the 6-core Phenom X6 in 2010 went completely unnoticed. Yes, in synthetic tests, these processors were really fast and often left the best quad processors behind, but at the same time, the then freshly released Stalker Call of Pripyat would utilize only about one and a half cores, and most games did the same. So there was either no difference in the FPS with the previous four core Phenoms, or the predecessors were even faster due to their higher clock speeds. And if we recall that the then fresh four core or i5 lineup dominated and continues to dominate the six core Phenoms thanks to a better architecture, it is not surprising that such CPUs failed and didn't sell. For this reason, users in the early 2010s continued to use their Core 2 Duos. These CPUs, even 5 years after their release, coped with all the games absolutely without issues. And I'm sure there are still people somewhere who keep torturing these processors to this day. But of course it couldn't go on like this forever. Microsoft was constantly updating new versions of DirectX, while Nvidia, ATI and then later AMD were actively developing their graphics accelerators. But the single core processor performance was not growing enough to ensure the ever increasing appetite for physics and level detail. In addition, game consoles starting with the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 were multi core. So by the end of the 2000s, the creators of games, for the most part, already knew how to spread the load across several cores. The last nail in the coffin of single core was driven by the release of the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. They got not only the x86 desktop architecture, but also 8-core processors. We need to thank console gamers, for each new generation of Xboxes and Playstations is a turning point in the development of PC gaming. In general, by the middle of the 2010s, most game engines had already been adapted to multi-threading. And it was a very difficult task, even the then latest DirectX 11 API was a high-level one, unlike the current DirectX 12 which means that it required the developers of each specific game to do a very fine job optimizing their projects so that they have an even load distribution across several cores. Everyone coped with this task differently. But in general, by that time, all the four cores of the four core processors and games were already utilized. 
However, the two core processors were still out there, doing their job just fine. Let's recall the popular and relatively recent bundle of the Pentium G6400 with the GDX 1050 Ti. And at this point, the progress halted. Yes, AMD tried by all means to save its 6-core Phenom and pseudo 8-core effects by releasing the low-level Mantle API, the mentions of which have already been removed from AMD's website. It perfectly distributed the load across a large number of cores, but this technology did not have any success with game developers. The most famous project with its support is Battlefield 4. As a result, AMD discontinued its support in 2019, but they did not completely abandon it. Mantle formed the basis of the Vulkan API, which is still popular today. Now let's go back to the mid-2010s. Ten years after the appearance of the first two-core and four-core CPUs, game developers have more or less implemented their support in their projects. That was the era of stagnation with the total dominance of the Team Blue processors. And the game devs stopped at this point. And just so that you could feel the full depth of the four-core crisis, you can still play Far Cry 5 and Control from 2019 on the Intel Quad from 2006. Yeah, you'll have to do some work up front, like installing the missing instructions, but still, 25 to 30 FPS are quite achievable. Just a reminder for you that by that time, the 16 thread Ryzen 7 CPUs had already been present in the market for a couple of years. I would like to give thanks to AMD. This company stubbornly refused to give up and in 2017 released their Ryzen CPUs with 8 honest real cores. Yes, they were quite expensive and not yet polished. Yes, they almost always lost in games to the 4 core Core i7s, but as we know now, in the end, Team Red emerged victorious and took away the title of the best manufacturer of the x86 processors from Team Blue. Although I'm sure after saying these words, I'll find a lot of interesting info in the comments explaining why the 400 watt i9-13900KS is the best processor one can get. Sure, go on and tell me about it. But why did AMD fail in 2010 with 6 cores and succeeded in 2017 with 8? Simply because the hardware cannot exist without technologies, which by then had already matured enough. Complex physics, fabric, light, fine hair. Then Microsoft realized that Mantle was actually an interesting API and rolled out a low-level DirectX 12 with improved support for multi-core processors in 2015. And AMD, in the same year, introduced Mantle 2.0, AK Vulcan. Of course, in the first games, there was no difference with the DirectX 11, and at times, the old API was even better. But in a couple of years, the DirectX 12 had already rolled out, and Ryzen CPUs entered the market that had already been prepared for real multi-core. Six years have passed since then. We live in a time of a new core count arms race, when over the past three years, we have been shown first the 16-core Ryzen 9, and then the 24-core i9. Compared to them, the 6 and 8 core solutions are simply lost in benchmarks and productivity tasks. But then, why would I say at the beginning of this video that 8 core solutions will last for a very long time? Let's look at the tests of the new Ryzen 7000 lineup in games. Both the 6 core Ryzen 5 and the 16 core Ryzen 9 are all capable of yielding more than 200 frames per second. And formally, there is the difference in the FPS between them but even an eSports player would hardly be able to distinguish 210 frames from 220. But when looking at the synthetic performance, the more expensive CPU is at least twice as fast. In the case of the latest Intel 13th generation, everything is similar. Both the 10-core i5 and the 24-core i9, again, show the same performance. Of course, there is some small imperceptible difference, which is definitely not something to care about. Okay, maybe things were a bit different in previous generations. No, the Ryzen 5 5600X and Ryzen 9 5950X tests show that the latter is, again, hardly any faster than the former. And this difference is noticeable, or rather not noticeable in fact, only at 1500 FPS. In the 12th generation, the situation is similar. Even the low clock speed 6 core Core i5 looks good when compared to the boosted i9 12900K. There is a difference of a couple of dozen frames, that at the level of about 150 FPS. It literally doesn't make any difference. Does it remind you of something? This is a direct analogy with 2005 and 2006, when solutions with a good core count increase entered the market unexpectedly. We are now seeing exactly the same explosive growth in the core count, the same unprepared gamers and users who, according to the Steam statistics, keep using 4-core CPUs, that is, they're at the level available 15 years ago, 
But here you may want to object. Modern game engines easily parallel across a couple of dozen threads. The Xeon tests demonstrate this perfectly well. Won't it happen that in a couple of years we will see 32 core solutions in the top and the basic Ryzen 5s and Core i5s will start with 12 or even 16 cores which will render the current 6 and 8 core solutions useless? Well, no one knows the future, but there are a few hints that 8 cores will be with us for a very long time and it will be enough for everyone. Firstly, the development of graphics technologies is close to its physical limit. Just take a look at the Unreal Engine 5 tech demos, which already delight us with photorealism and at the same time require more attention to the GPU than to the CPU performance. Here is an interesting piece of statistics for you that also confirms this. If from 1995 to 2010 as many as 11 versions of DirectX were released, then over the past 10 years only DirectX 12, and there are not even rumors about 13. So hardly any Ryzen 7 7700X, which now works at a couple of hundred frames per second in modern games with complex geometry and physics, will drop below 100 FPS even in 5 years. Secondly, now the development of graphics technologies causes the calculations to move from the CPU to the GPU. For example, the DLSS3 technology is all about making the video card generate intermediate frames in a calculation of which the CPU is not involved at all. As a result, you get double the FPS and the CPU load remains the same. Or take the direct storage technology. It allows you to move the process of unpacking the assets of the game world from the CPU to the GPU, which again, according to the Microsoft tests, significantly reduces the load on the processor. Or take the resizable bar technology, which allows you to use the frame buffer more efficiently to transfer data between the CPU and GPU, which, in the case of Intel graphics cards, can raise FPS by 30 to 40 percent. Of course, not all of these technologies are actively used by game developers yet, but it's obviously a matter of time. So, in the future, the life of the processor will become easier, which cannot be said about graphics cards. Thirdly, Let's recall the consoles that game developers actively rely on. The modern PS5 and Xbox series have 8 cores based on the Zen 2 architecture, that is, at the level of Ryzen 7 3700X or I don't know, 5700X, and this is quite enough without any doubt for the performance at the level of 60 frames per second, and it will be enough for at least another 5 years until the release of the new generation consoles, of course. Finally, we have come close to our physical limit of perception of reality. If absolutely everyone can see the difference between 30 and 60 FPS, the difference between 60 and 120 FPS is hardly noticeable. And that is why the 60Hz standard has been with us for a long time now. Talking about 120 and 240Hz, for the majority of people the difference will only be noticeable if compared directly, if at all. Going to 360 and even more so 480Hz looks like pure marketing. Even eSports players will hardly ever feel such a difference, so it turns out that a modern processor under liquid nitrogen, rendering a thousand frames per second in Doom, is something beyond our perception of this world. In addition, users are increasingly considering 2K and 4K monitors for purchase, which have very serious requirements for the graphics card. And if you can expect 100 frames per second in Full HD with the RTX 3060, the 4K resolution is often too much even for the 1490. The bottleneck of the modern systems is the GPU, while the CPU doesn't even break a sweat. So what do we see in the end? Excellent load distribution with the bias towards reducing the CPU load, the transition to high resolutions and 8 cores in consoles lead to the logical conclusion that such a core count is really enough for everyone and for a long time for a smooth gameplay. Especially when you consider that history is cyclic and not only in the case of the core count arms race. According to the Steam statistics, the most popular cards come with indexes 50 and 60, that is, mid-tier cards that are hardly ever expected to render more than 100 frames in Full HD. Speaking of 60 frames per second in most modern games, there are no problems with it even if you're rocking the 4-core Core i3-12100, and we will prove this in one of our next videos. Perhaps in the future when everyone will use the most complex VR suits with maximum tactile impact requiring serious calculations from the processor, it will force virtual residents to switch to processors with a couple dozen cores. But for the coming years, we are stuck in 2D where we already have a level of photorealism. Path tracing seems to be the last step to this. However, video games aside, there are plenty of computational tasks that will happily devour all the resources of a top-notch PC and ask for more. This includes neural networks training, 
complex physics calculation and high quality rendering. Most of these tasks have an important feature. They can be perfectly paralleled across literally any number of threads. And the Cinebench benchmark running on a 72-core machine looks simply fascinating. Modern chip makers are trying to sit on two chairs at once. On the one hand, most of the buyers of top-tier home PCs are gamers, and for their sake, Intel and AMD are increasing single-threaded performance in order to add a couple more frames to the already excessive high FPS capabilities of modern CPUs. On the other hand, withdrawing from the core count arms race will mean an automatic loss to the opponent in the future. So it turns out that companies are held hostage by the situation. An attempt to increase the core count and the clock speed while being unable to shrink the process node as fast and the total dominance of marketing that only cares about numbers on the graphs leads to the appearance of super hot processors absolutely useless for gamers. Therefore, if you want to build yourself a reasonably priced top-tier gaming rig with a good margin for the future, forget about the promotional slides of the 16-core Ryzen 9 or 24-core Core i9. You will never need them. 6 or 8-core CPUs are your choice.